Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Another beautiful Sunday. Worship is to feel in your heart and express in some appropriate manner a humbling but delightful sense of admiring awe and astonished wonder and overpowering love in the presence of that most ancient mystery, that majesty which philosophers call the first cause, but which we call our Father, which art in heaven. Our first hymn today is Because I Have Been Given Much. Thank you. 
In good times, in bad times, in joyous times, in rough times, all the time. Our next hymn is Give Thanks My Soul to Harvest. place today 
and we will give you the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'm going to ask if Diane, if you will come on up and lead us in our responsive reading this morning. And it's, I'll let tell you, it's coming out of Matthew chapter 10. It will be verses 5 through 16. She's going to read the words in white. And we will follow along the words in yellow. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go out among the Gentiles or enter any town of Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come here. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag of his journey or barrel's shirt or sandals or staff, for the worker is as as he. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is a servant, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I am saying now that she shall not boast. Therefore, it is true as a saint and as a saint as well. Yes. Yes. Good morning to all. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, moments with God are wonderful. This one he says, I keep every promise. You will feast on my faithfulness as I fulfill every promise that I have spoken. When the winds of testing come, do not lose hope. The protection of my presence hides you. I will keep you safe so that not a single bit of my goodness will be lost. For even in destruction, I rebuild and restore. I make all things new. Trust me, for I always lead you in love. I will keep you safe. I am constant and true. Fix your heart on me and set your eyes on my trustworthy character. Even if you were to forget my promises, I never will. I am unchanging in loyal love and magnanimous mercy. I see every detail that you overlook. When you think you know better than I do, live into my wisdom. I will share my perspective with you when you ask. Trust me, my child. I will fulfill your hopes more sweetly than you could ever imagine. Don't look away from my loving kindness for a moment, and you will never need to worry. There is no risk of failure in me because I never falter. You have tasted my goodness, but you are not finished yet. There is always more for you. Press into my heart today and feast on my affection. Keep trusting in the Lord and do what is right in his eyes. Psalm 37, 3. Fix your heart on the promises of God and you will be secure, feasting on his faithfulness. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you'll flip through your pages or swipe with your finger, whatever you do, uh, to get to the scripture of Acts chapter 2. We are going to be here actually for, I thought it was just going to be, this week we'd be wrapping up, I lied, 
Well, actually, I did fly. God just had other plans. And I think that we are actually going to be speaking about Pentecost for the next couple of weeks. Because I think there's a couple of major messages God wants us to hear through this. And next week, we're going to be talking about the power that was released that day. But we're going to start by reading verse, or verse 1 and reading through verse 3. It tells us there, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord, that being the disciples and the apostles, in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Let's pray. Lord God, as we begin to explore Pentecost today, God, would you do something fresh within our hearts and within our lives as we take a look at what it is that you did at this day where the church went through a time of resurgence. And God, help us understand what it is that's necessary for us to see a move of your spirit to be unleashed yet again. Fresh and new. Lord, we know your spirit is moving. But God, we need a dynamic manifestation of your spirit in our country, in our world, to turn hearts to you. But Lord God, help us to see what we need to see through this time when you released your spirit for the very first time. So Lord God, we can move in freedom with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. This is where we are going to be staying today. We are not really going to be getting much into the, the mighty rushing wind, tons of fire, and the mighty message that God proclaimed when revival broke out in Jerusalem. I think today God just wants us to focus on chapter 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come. Now you go into most churches today and you ask them, what, you know, what is Pentecost? They will refer to this passage. They will mention as though somehow this was the first Pentecost. Can I tell you it was not? Well, hold on. I, I've read through scripture. I don't see it anywhere else. Oh, yes, you have. You've read about it in the Old Testament, believe it or not. Though if you do a word search with your Bible or, or through your software, you might see only Acts popping up. And there's a reason for this, you see, because the word Pentecost is a Greek term. But the truth of the matter is the day of Pentecost referred to a Hebrew, a Jewish festival. Pentecost is what the Greeks referred to it as. When you read through the Old Testament, you read about it about five to other times, referring to the Feast of Harvest, or perhaps you've heard of the Feast of Weeks. Yeah. This is the day of Pentecost. You see, Pentecost was the celebration, because I don't know about you. In fact, when Sonia first picked the songs for this week, I was like, okay, Sonia, yeah, let's go for it. But I have to admit, in my own heart, I'm like, you know, that one song sounds like a Thanksgiving song. <laughs> and I had about half of my message written, but all of a sudden I started doing research and began to discover something very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Because the Feast of Weeks, you know what that refers to? It's a celebration of harvest. <laughs> In fact, it's a celebration of a couple of different harvests. Because you see, in in the Palestine, there were two harvests that took place every year. There was the early harvest that came during the months of May and June, and then the final harvest came in the fall. Pentecost was the celebration of the beginning of the early wheat harvest. But you see, in the Feast of Weeks, there's another feast that's kind of associated with that. It's called the Feast of First Fruits. 
In fact, you can't really understand what the Feast of Weeks is, or what the Feast of Harvest is, without first knowing what the, first, what, what the Feast of First Fruits is. And want to take a guess at when it takes place? It takes place 50 days before the Feast of Harvest. 50 days before. You have to know when the, first, the, the Feast of First Fruits is and count out 50 days from there. Now let me ask you something. What happened 50 days before Pentecost? Jesus rose from the dead. And see, pr prior to these feasts, there was another feast. And we're going to be celebrating that feast a little bit later on this morning. It's called the Feast of Passover. And we, we, we don't call it Passover here, we call it Communion. Following after Jesus' principle, when he celebrated the final Passover, which is often referred to as the Last Supper with his disciples. And that's when he took the bread and took the cup, you remember, and he gave new definition to those, saying that these things are me. Right? This is my body, this is my blood that's being given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then following that, you have him being crucified, and then on the day of first, on at the Feast of First Fruits, being raised from the dead, which is why Paul refers to him in scripture as being the first fruits of those risen from the dead. It's referring to not just the fact that he was the first to ever be risen, it's the fact that it took place here. Now, can I tell you the other amazing thing about all this is, this didn't just happen then. This was set in motion 4,000 years earlier. Because you might remember that the Israelites found themselves in a place called the wilderness. Yes. At the foot of a mountain called Mount Sinai, where laws were given. And they were commanded to celebrate certain feasts and festivals, and these were they. So why? Just so they could have a reason to party? No. It was because it was painting a picture for them of what was yet to come. That through the Passover, that Jesus was going to be that Passover lamb, die for their sins. But the, because of the feast of first fruits, he is the first fruits of the harvest starting. Right? The church gets set in motion. But then, 50 days later, and the reason they call it the Feast of Weeks is for this reason, if you think about it. 50 days is roughly seven weeks, which are each comprised of seven days apart. So it's basically, it's, it's we got the week of weeks. Seven weeks of seven days. And so what that symbolized for them was that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. But you know what? There's going to be an outpouring that's going to take place that's going to cause the harvest to be brought in. But it's not the only harvest. Because there's a couple of harvests. Spring, fall. Because see, there's another festival, it's called the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's referring to the final harvest that's brought in. Of course, we know that symbolizes Jesus when he comes again, sets up his kingdom on this world, right? He's going to, first he's going to take us all home to be with him, then he's going to come and set up his throne. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come, this is why it was so important for Jesus to choose when he was going to be crucified. You see, the world didn't just crucify him when it was convenient. Jesus said himself, I determined when I lay my life down and when I will rise up again. And he was very deliberate in the fact of when he was going to be handed over to the Roman soldiers. Because he knew that that needed to take place so that on the, day, the Feast of First Fruits, he could be risen. So that 50 days later, specifically on a day forecasted 4,000 years earlier, through the mouth of God to his servant Moses, this could all be fulfilled. Tell me all this happened by chance. So they understood that this day was a day of salvation. It was a day of harvest. It was a day of bringing in. And Jesus had referred to this concept, hadn't he? Many times throughout his teachings, whether he was speaking about the parable of the soils, or whether he was speaking to them out of Luke chapter 10 when he said, look under the fields, they're ripe unto harvest. So, you know what? Pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And now go. 
and you do it. And so they had to go, they had to go to Jerusalem, they had to wait, and when the day of Pentecost had fully come, the Holy Spirit is poured out. But, something had to happen first. Before the Holy Spirit could fully be manifested on them so that they could, because it wasn't just for them, we realize that, right? This wasn't just for them to have a nice, wonderful Jesus experience in an upper room with wind and fire. This was to empower the church so they could go out of that room and actually preach the gospel to the people to the point that it would touch the right where they were and 3,000 men plus women and children gave their hearts to Christ. But before that level of power could be poured out, before it could be made manifest, the first thing that had to take place is they had to be in one accord in one place. They had to be in one accord. No, that's not saying that God favored Hondas over Mazdas. Okay? Not that kind of accord. But what it is talking about is they came together. Remember, day 40, when Jesus is caught up to be with, with the Father in the cloud, he told them, go to Jerusalem and wait. And they, so they went to Jerusalem, and they waited. They had a prayer meeting, and they waited for 10 days for the Holy Spirit to show up. Now, did they wait at their homes? I don't think so. I think they were pricked. They didn't know when exactly he was going to come. And they didn't want to miss it. So they were gathered in one place for 10 days. I don't know if they had food there. Pretty sure they didn't have showers. <laughs> and you know what? They didn't have air conditioning. I know that much. And I don't know about you, but it starts getting a little hot and muggy. I get a little cranky. And when I get cranky, things that don't normally bother me start to irritate me. Things I've been able to kind of keep stuffed for a while go bleh all over everybody, right? <laughs> And I can't help but think that when you're sitting in a room with the same people for 10 days and you're praying and you're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come, you're, whatever this promise of the Father is going to be, they didn't know it was going to be called the Holy Spirit at the moment. Well, actually, until Christ revealed that. But they didn't know how he was going to show up. He didn't know how he was going to manifest just that he was. But when is this going to happen? And you know what, I, I can't help but think that in the midst of those days, yeah. there's a little bit of rubbing going on. Mm. Maybe some rubbing of personalities. <laughs> Somebody was probably trying to take charge. <laughs> I can only guess that was probably Peter. <laughs> <laughs> and if that was the case, you know some other people like James and John weren't too crazy about that idea. Sons of thunder, they are. Right? And Peter, you know what? You do this that irritates me. And who are you to say that you're in charge? And I, I don't know if this is the exact conversation. I'm only surmising here, so thus say if I'm not the Lord. But I can't help but think that maybe, you know, because we know that James and John kind of had chips on their shoulders because they had a mother that had a chip on hers. You remember the story, right? She shows up and says to Jesus, hey, you might let one of my sons sit on your right and one sit on your left. Put them in those great places of prominence. And I don't know why she said that. I don't know if that was just the kind of mother she was or if they were kind of pleaded their cause to mom, saying, we don't understand why it is that Jesus seems to favor Peter over everybody else. Because <laughs> <laughs> after all, Jesus just got done telling them in front of everybody, right, not too long earlier, when Jesus said to the people, say, I am, and Jesus, or Peter said, you're the Christ, before anybody else could say a word. And Jesus said, well, you're right, and from this point on, I'm going to call your name Peter. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And you know Peter got puffed up a little bit with that one. Being the fisherman that he was, and having the ego that he had. Until Christ transformed him. can't help but think there's some opinions being shared. 
that maybe there was some things that had been buried that all of a sudden found themselves working mm -hmm. to the surface. And I think some conversation had to take place. And I think there's maybe some Holy Spirit conviction going on. But whatever transpired, we know this much. We know that the disciples didn't always get along. Don't get me wrong, they loved one another. They just didn't always like each other. They, there were personality conflicts. There were things of that nature that were happening. But it tells us when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord. Somewhere along the line, they all got on the same page. And now don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not saying they were odds with each other, they were beating each other up. But you know, you've heard me say it before, where two or three are gathered, there will be conflict. Show me any marriage that doesn't have it. Show me any brother-sister relationship that doesn't have it. So you can't put 12 adults when you got a bunch of them that are fishermen and tax collectors and doctors and all this kind of stuff in the same room and then not think there's going to be just a little bit of disagreement somewhere. But in the midst of this time, they got things right. Mm -hmm. They would say, you know what? I love you. But I'm going to love you like I never loved you before. I'm going to love you to a point that, you know what? It's no longer about my opinion or if I feel validated or if I feel respected. Who cares about me? And I don't mean that in an Eeyore type concept. Good. But what I am saying is it's got to get to the point for the church. It's got to get to the point for each and every single one of us where it's no longer about my feelings. It's no longer about my opinion. It's no longer about my respect. Do we want those things? Do we feel we deserve those things? Yeah, there's the problem. Because we think we deserve. And know that we are concept right there testifies of pride. Does it not? But again, if we're going to be the kind of people God wants us to be, we've got to be able to reiterate the words of Paul when he said, I'm crucified with Christ. And understand fully what that means. It means I'm crucified with everything about me. And you know what? My only desire in life is to love people and to actually outlove them. Amen. Not so that I can look better than them, but I should have such passion and compassion for people that my sole desire is to do nothing but I'll love the person to my left and the person to my right. Amen. So that there's no way that they could ever say, I'm not loved. Does it mean we're not going to have disagreements? Absolutely not. You will. But you know what? Can we love each other? Right? And I think that this is a problem. This is one of the main problems with the church, because as we read through the rest of this, and you go all the way to the end of this chapter, chapter 2, and you're looking at verses 42 through 47, read through that, and we'll, we'll be getting into that as well, I'm sure. But you begin to read that, and you see how much it has to deal with the relationship with one another. And you begin to see how much it had to deal with how, not just the, that they decided to love, not just that they had a passion love, the love was lived out in every action that they performed, every conversation that they had. It says they had peace with one another and with all the people. Mm -hmm. And what was the end result? God added, not they added, not their marketing strategies. God added daily to their number of those that were being saved. I believe that what we see at the very beginning of this chapter is exactly what we see at the end, where God is making clear that there's a day that I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. But what I need you to do first, church, is this. Be in one accord. Let nothing be in you that feels slighted or upset with another. And if there is, be willing to crucify those things. Because if we do, 
Because of what we see at the end of this chapter, and what we see here is that as they did that, as they were in one accord, in one place, they didn't love each other from a distance. You get that. They loved each other up close and personal. And then what did it say? And suddenly, the Spirit came. But what had to happen first? One accord. One heart. One mind. Not uniformity, but unity. Letting people be who they are. Not expecting them to become like you. Isn't it amazing how many times we like to point out the faults of others and, that, and it's like because we don't like what they do because we wouldn't do that? Or am I the only one that does that? But has it ever amazed you at times when you've done a little bit of a self-evaluation that sometimes the very things that irritate us about somebody else are the very things that exist within ourselves? Yeah. A lot of us don't like seeing ourselves in the mirror when we see our shortcomings. So we like to put it on somebody else. Easier that way. Okay, maybe just me. Love people. Let Jesus worry about the other stuff. You know, I'm not saying there's not a time we don't confront behaviors or things like that. We do so, but we do so in love, right? We do so, do so in a way that's going to bring life to the person. And if we can live this, and it's hard. It's easy to live it on a Sunday morning because we're all praising God and everything's good and happy. But summer's coming. If I'm in a room without air conditioning, watch out. <laughs> Set me straight if I start getting an attitude. Okay? We've got to let people speak into our lives. Amen. That's the other part of this whole one accord thing. Never ever get to the point where we think we're somehow better than the other person. You know, or that, oh, you know what, I'll forgive this person because they did this to me. Here's an eye opener start by forgiving yourself. Start by going to that person and asking them to forgive you for your attitude. Even if they didn't see it. Some of you have heard this story before, and I'm just going to share this. And then we're just going to go straight into communion this morning. But I had a situation very much like this. Somebody got under my skin. I love the guy. Didn't have any issues with him. Had no reason to have any issues with him. But man, the guy, you know... Whenever I would lead worship, things seemed to go well. You know, whenever, I would, whenever he was up there leading worship, the Holy Spirit just didn't seem to be there. I wonder what that guy's problem is. Being honest, that's what I was thinking. So I prayed for him. Notice nothing was changing. Kept praying for him. And all of a sudden, one day, I'm in our living room in Sullivan, and praying for this guy, and... <clears throat> God says, wrong prayer. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, he's not going with the issue. You are. I'm like, okay, well, what is he? He's like, you're jealous. I am not jealous. I don't have a jealous bone in my body. He's like, oh, yes, you are. And this is why you're jealous. Because he can play by ear. You have to play by no. And you're jealous of that gift. <laughs> and I wanted to rear up with my Hungarian attitude and say, God, you're wrong, but you know where that goes. <laughs> So I stopped before I got there. And I began to think, maybe, he's, maybe he knows something I've been ignoring. And I began to open myself up, and I just let that sink in. And I was like, you know what, God, you're right. I didn't see it. I didn't realize it. And I know I didn't come up with those ideas because my brain don't think that fast. And I was ready to give my arguments against him. Quickly, he was there with the other answer. So I got flat on my face before God. God cleaned me out. Set me right. Got done with that. And I got up feeling like everything was done with the amen. And God said, you're not done. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I am. God. I, I feel like you forgive me. He's like, oh, yeah, you're done with that part. <clears throat> well, what, what needs to be done? He's like, you need to pick up that phone. You need to call him right now. But God, he doesn't know about any of this. I don't care. You need to do this. So I had to pick up the phone, 
<laughs> and you know what's the funny part? As I'm dialing out, saying, oh God, don't let him be on the other end. <laughs> You're like, no, don't let him answer, don't let him answer. <laughs> Two rings. I wasn't even his wife that picked up, it was him. <laughs> hey, Sal. What's up? No, not much. Nothing's good. So I had a great time with God on my face. And is that, before I go to St. John, I just want to say we're all good. Like, what? <laughs> but like, yeah, he wouldn't let me off the hook. And I began to share with him. It's like, Phil, I need you to forgive me for my attitude. What did I think he did? Even if it was about something he did, you know what? I'm not, God doesn't expect me to be responsible for what that person does. He expects me to be responsible for my part. Amen. And I got honest with him, and I'm like, I, I'm so sorry. It's like, I, I never had any hard feelings. I didn't know this was there until God pointed it out. And so, will you forgive me? Yeah, sure, no problem. But so I, get, I just have one question for him. I'm like, sure, what's that? He's like, can you forgive me too? I'm like, for what? I've had the same issue. I've been jealous of you because you can play by note and I can only play by ear. <laughs> and the two of us had a great revival right there on the phone. You know? But can I tell you, that's. That's the one accord stuff. You know, it's the willingness when we're not going to let anything disrupt. Even if we think we got it settled with Jesus, that's the cop out. That's the easy way out. Dare to make sure that there's no place for the enemy to get a foothold, ever. Seal up all the cracks. And like Joshua, be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God will go with you wherever you go. Even in the midst of those moments. See, the enemy, if there's one thing he doesn't want, it's unity. Because when the church gets to that place of unity, there is nothing that can stop it. When we are unified with one another, which by the way only comes as we stay unified with him. But as we have that unity, there's nothing that can come against the church. But can I also say this? And I've been in a lot of churches over the course of my life, from my dad being a pastor, from pastoring ourselves. And I can tell you with full 100% confidence that the one way I've seen the enemy try to destroy any church has always been from within, never from without. Because if we're, if, if we're solid within, nothing can touch us. But if we're not, yes. we're dead in the water. Yes. You want to see revival? You want to see Charlestown and the surrounding area get saved? I know we all do. But you know what? First thing that's got to happen, if we really want to see it happen, or do we want it bad enough that we're willing to make sure our one accord is all sheared up the way it needs to be? So I would encourage you, because we're going to be going into that place for you, I'm going to ask Nancy to come on down and, and lead us into that place. And then we're going to, afterwards, we're going to close with a song together. But I really would encourage you just to do some searching within yourself. That's what would reveal to you if there's anything. For some, it might be a great, it might be the door's wide open. For others, it might just be the door's just not fully latched. You know? Get it settled with God as we pass out the elements this morning. And um, don't wait until we're ready to take the elements. Take this time. We're not going to play any music. And this is going to be really boring for those of you on Facebook. But oh well. <laughs> okay? But there's going to be, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to allow total silence as the elements are being passed out. So I want you just to spend some hard time with Jesus. Have a real Jesus experience yourself right now. And ask God, God, is there anything that might be standing in the way of it with this one accord thing? And God, if there is, get me right. And then God, give me courage to do what I need to do from this day forward in dealing with that thing, whatever that might be.
but just take time to see God as they distribute the elements. What can I add? He touched on every one of my comments that was going to make. <clears throat> Almost. Ironically, I asked the Lord, how many should I, cups should I put out? He says, out four and twenty, for four and twenty elders. There's not a single cup left. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lord. That's the Lord's Yeah, that's right. We're waiting for that day. <laughs> I read something recently and it, it struck a, a note of me that uh, Jesus, when he walk around ministry when he was living here, he picked common, ordinary things to talk about. And he made them important. Like a single grain of corn, a mustard seed, a glass of wine. It was very common in the Middle East to drink wine as a way to be uh, hydrated because the water was usually so bad you couldn't drink it. And bread, very integral part of the Jewish diet. And it wasn't the bread that we eat today, it was, it was much better for you <laughs> than what we eat. So he picked those things and he shared them with his disciples. He made those common things important. So as he made them important to us, I made it important to me to pay attention to what Jesus said about the things that seem mundane. So, Pastor said earlier that he passed out the bread and he's iterized that uh, it was his body that was going to be broken. So we break and eat together. Hmm. It's changing. Lord, change me. Also, the cup after he had given thanks. He says, this cup represents my blood which is going to be shed for, for many for the remission of sin. All other bloods were failed 
to take away the pain and the penalty of sin. But his did not fail. Shall we partake together? We thank you, God, for this opportunity to come before you on common ground as one body of believers trusting in the things that you have shed our way. May we be good stewards of those things and we'll carefully give you the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet as we close when Sonic Sonny comes up to lead us. And Sonic kind of, I think, maybe you'd say is a traditional song where we're going to end up next week as we can talk about the harvest what took place. But um, let us just sing this from our hearts. Oddly enough, before we start with the song, um, a lot of times God will give me a verse for the coming week. And I usually get that verse before Pastor Tim and I meet for practice on Wednesdays. For some strange reason, and I know a lot of people call it coincidence with the message that was given today, but I call it a god coincidence because I don't believe in coincidences where God is concerned. Um, the verses are 1 John 3, 16 through 18. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and sees his brother have need, and shutteth up compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. And when we love each other as a group of Christians, love for one another with our minds, our hearts, and our bodies. In mind, we are there to give each other counsel, as the scriptures tell us. With our hearts, compassion for what each other is going through. And with our bodies, we help one another whenever help is needed. How much more important is it for us to also love those who know him not? That way they can understand Christ's love through us. Our last hymn is Once to Every Man and Nation. <laughs> 